My name's uh, Sam Pang, but that's not the reason you're here. We're here, of course, because of John Ronson and this book, The Psychopath Test. Uh, tonight, you're going to get something that you uh, didn't get on Q&A last night. You're actually going to hear from John. Uh, if you do see uh, Slavoj Zizek um, just running towards the stage, it's, it's not a drill. We tackle him. Um, we, we just we can't afford to have him up here tonight. Um, thank you again for coming. Um, who has read the book? Great. That's a, that's a great start. I'm sure John will be proud. The last time I was here, I was uh, interviewing Arne Doe about his book, The Happiest Refugee, and I asked the question, had anyone uh, read the book? In, in hindsight, I probably should have asked Arne if he'd written the book. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> Wow, booing, good start. John will be wrapped. Let's, uh, let's, the format tonight will be a little bit different. Usually um, uh, the host and the guest chat for 45 minutes and then there's some Q&A, but tonight it's a little bit different. Uh, John is going to come up and just, uh, just take over the lectern for as long as he wants. It's his, uh, it's his show. Then we'll have a little chat and then we'll throw it over to you for Q&A. So... Um, Let's just get straight to it. Of course, later on, John will be uh, up the back signing some books for you, so uh, he'll be there. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason we're all here, John Ronson. Thanks. What? What's so funny about the way I came up on stage? I didn't want funny. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. Hello, thank you very much indeed for coming. You are, Q&A was a completely unexpected mind fuck. I had no idea. <laughs> I thought, I thought, because I didn't properly check like the notes of my schedule, and I thought it was just going to be like someone sitting down being nice to me. <laughs> and I had no idea that it was like one of those situations where incredibly uh, fast thinking, polemical ideologues are the ones who look good. <laughs> This is why I always avoid that kind of thing. I'm, I'm trying to, I've got like an ambition to try and make um, uh, sort of wet doubt seem attractive, but I've got, <laughs> but I've got a feeling I'm going to lose that battle. Anyway, hello. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit, not too long, about, about um, my new book, The Psychopath Test. Uh, it, it started, I was at a friend's house and she had on her shelf a copy of. Uh, the DSM manual, do people know it? Yeah, it's, it's the manual of um, mental disorders. Uh, and it used to be, like, a couple of decades ago, it was a very thin pamphlet, like 65 pages. And uh, now it's an 886 page brick uh, listing every known mental disorder. There's currently 374 mental disorders. Uh, so I was looking through it, trying to work out if I had any mental disorders. And it turns out I've got 12. Um, <laughs> I've got, um, I've got nightmare disorder, uh, which is categorized if you have recurrent dreams of being pursued or declared a failure. And all my dreams, especially after Q&A, um, <laughs> involve Slovo chasing me down the street going, you're a failure. Uh, and I've got, um, I've got generalized anxiety disorder, which is a given. I've got, uh, I've got malingering. Um, <laughs> And I think it's probably quite rare to have malingering and generalized anxiety disorder because uh, <laughs> malingering tends to make me feel very anxious. Uh, I've got parent-child relational problems, uh, which I blame my mother for. Uh, <laughs> And so on. So, so I was looking at this manual, wondering what was going on here. You know, was, was, was I much crazier than I thought I was? Or maybe it's not a good idea to self-diagnose if you're not a trained professional. Uh, or maybe the psychiatry profession has a kind of strange fetish to, to uh, polemically label 
uh, normal behavior as a mental disorder. I didn't know which of those things was true. Much later, by the way, I met the person who turned the DSM from a pamphlet into a brick. It's a man called Robert Spitzer. And he told me how he did it. Um, he, had a, uh, he, he booked a conference room at Columbia University and basically invited anybody along who felt the same way he did, which was basically to eradicate Freud from psychiatry and replace it with a checklist culture. Uh, he thought that Freud was a pseudoscientist. Uh, so, he, so he had a typewriter, and he said, have we got any ideas for mental disorders? And they go, ah, bulimia! And he'd go, what's his overt characteristics? And I'd go, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And type it in, and that's how, that's how bulimia came to be uh, invented, and ADHD. Um, I asked him whether there were any proposed mental disorders that he rejected, uh, and he said, yeah, there was one. Uh, atypical child syndrome. Uh, he said, the problem is when I asked the man proposing it what the shared characteristics were, uh, he said, well, that's very hard to say because the children are very atypical. <laughs> and also, um, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, masochistic disorder, which was basically labelling as mentally disordered women who stayed with abusive husbands. That one, got, that one got rejected as well. He said by the feminists. Here you went. Uh, it got put in the appendix as a self-defeating personality disorder. By the way, anyway. <laughs> I didn't know any of that at the time, but I was interested by the manual. By the way, can people hear, hear me at the back? Is, the, am I, is my microphone technique OK? There's no issues in that regard. <laughs> Would it have been better if I just hadn't diverged to discussing that at this stage? <laughs> OK. Um, I thought it was very interesting, uh, and I wanted to meet a critic of psychiatry to try and find out their view on it, uh, which is how I ended up having lunch with the Scientologists, uh, who've got, as I'm sure a lot of you know, a crack team of psychiatry busters uh, who travel the world trying to destroy psychiatrists. Uh, anyway, I said to them, could you prove to me that psychiatry is a pseudoscience, it can't be trusted? And they said, yes, we can prove it to you uh, by introducing you to Tony. Uh, I said, who's Tony? They said, Tony's in Broadmoor, which is Britain's most notorious secure mental hospital. It used to be known as the Broadmoor Asylum for the Criminally Insane. Uh, I said, what, what did Tony do? Uh, and the Scientologist said, Hardly anything. Uh, he beat someone up, faked madness uh, to get out of prison sentence, and now he's stuck at Broadmoor. And the more he tries to convince people he's sane, the more they take it as evidence that he's crazy. Uh, do you want us to get you into Broadmoor to meet Tony? So I said, yes, please. So I'm going to read a tiny bit from the book uh, um, about uh, going to Broadmoor to meet Tony. Uh, we went to the wellness centre, uh, which is where you meet the patients, and uh, they all started uh, drifting in, and they were all quite sort of sluggish and overweight and wearing sweatpants, and, and, and then um, Brian, the Scientologist, said, oh, there's Tony. Uh, and Tony came in, and he, and he wasn't overweight. He was in very good shape, uh, and he was wearing a pinstripe suit, and he was walking towards me with his arm outstretched like someone out of The Apprentice. Um, <laughs> the, the outfit of somebody who really wanted to convince me that he was very sane. Uh, so I said, so is it true that you faked your way in here? And he said, yeah, absolutely. I beat someone up uh, in Reading Town Centre. And my cellmate said, you're looking at five to seven years. So what you have to do is fake madness. Tell him you're mad. It's easy. Just tell the prison psychiatrist that you're mad. And you'll end up going to some cushy hospital. And you have your own PlayStation. And nurses will bring you pizzas. So I said, so how did you do it? He said, well, I've just seen this film called Crash, uh, in which people get sexual pleasure from crashing cars into walls. Uh, so I asked to see the prison psychiatrist, and I said, um, I get sexual pleasure from crashing cars into walls. And I said, what else? He said, oh, yeah, uh, I said to the psychiatrist that I wanted to watch women as they died because it would make me feel more normal. And I said, where'd you get that from? He said, oh, a biography of Ted Bundy that they had in the prison library. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he faked madness much too well. He got sent to Broadmoor, took one look at the place, said there's been a terrible misunderstanding. <laughs> if he'd done uh, time for the GBH, he'd have got five years. I said, how long have you been in Broadmoor for? He said, uh, 12 years. <laughs> 
It is an awful lot harder, Tony told me, to convince people you're sane than it is to convince them you're crazy. I thought the best way to seem normal, he said, would be to talk to people normally about normal things. That's the obvious thing to do, right? I subscribe to New Scientist. I like reading about scientific breakthroughs. One time they had an article about how the US Army was training bumblebees to sniff out explosives. So I said to a nurse, did you know that the US Army is training bumblebees to sniff <laughs> <laughs> Later, when I read my medical notes, I saw they'd written, thinks bees can sniff out explosives. <laughs> I think it's lucky that I didn't meet any psychiatrists when I was writing The Many Stoic Goats, which is full of that. For people who don't, it's um, a story about I met a, a special forces soldier called Glenn Wheaton, who told me he was part of a secret unit called Project Jedi. And I said, what, what happened in He said, it's a series of levels. And I said, what was level one? He said, level one was observation. You walk into a room, how many chairs are in the room? He said, the super soldier would just know. <laughs> I said, what was level two? He said, level two is intuition. You have a fork in the road. Do you go left? Do you go right? You go right. And I said, well, what was level three? He said, level three was invisibility. <laughs> and I said, um, it's quite a leap from, uh, <laughs> from level two. I said, what, well, actual invisibility? And he said, at first. But after a while, we adapted it to just trying to find a way of not being seen. <laughs> yeah. So I said, like, camouflage. And he went, no. <laughs> and he said, level four was killing a goat just by wanting the goat to die. And I said, did you ever manage it? And he said, yeah, one, one time. Uh, but the man doing the staring, uh, his heart got damaged. And I said, what was the goat psychically fighting back? <laughs> I said, no, the goat didn't stand a chance. Uh, he said it was uh, what's known in paranormal circles as uh, sympathetic injury. Yeah. One time they put uh, 30 uh, goats in a room and numbered them, and they're all staying at goat number 16, and goat number 17 fell over. <laughs> Which I guess is collateral damage. <laughs> when he decided to wear pinstripe to meet me, I said, did you realize the look could go either way? Yes, said Tony, but I thought I'd take my chances. Plus, most of the patients here are disgusting slobs who don't wash or change their clothes for weeks on end, and I like to dress well. He told me that he, um, on one side of him, he had the Stockwell Strangler, and on the other side of him, he had the Tiptoe Through the Tulips Rapist. And he said, so he found them quite unsavory, so he stayed in his room a lot. Uh, and they took that as a sign of madness, that he was aloof and grandiose. And so only in Broadmoor would not wanting to hang out with the Stockwell Strangler be a sign of madness. Um, anyway, Tony seemed completely normal to me, um, but what did I know? So I left and um, wrote to his clinician, and I said, so what's the story? And his clinician wrote back to me and said, yeah, we accept that his story is true. We accept he faked madness to get out of a prison sentence because his, uh, his delusions were very uh, cliched uh, and they just vanished the minute he got to Broadmoor. But we've assessed him and we've decided that what he is is a psychopath, uh, and that faking madness is exactly the kind of cunning and manipulative act of a psychopath. So faking your brain going wrong is evidence that your brain has gone wrong. Uh, and I said, what else? He said, yeah, the pinstripe suits, classic psychopath. Uh, uh, he said, that's items um, one and two on the checklist, uh, grandiose sense of self-worth and glibness, superficial charm. And I said, what else? He said, yeah, keeping to himself, you know, wanting to hang out with his neighbors, classic psychopath, because um, it speaks to lack of empathy and grandiosity. So all the things that seemed most normal about Tony was evidence. His psychiatrist was saying that he was mad in this different way. He was a psychopath. And his clinician said, if you want to know more, you can go on a psychopath spotting course uh, run by Robert Hare, who invented the checklist. Uh, so I did. I, I went on a course. Uh, and I became and am now an adept uh, and professionally trained psychopath spotter. Um, so the statistic is that one in 100 regular walking around people is a psychopath. So how many people are in this room? Out of 300? So it's three 
psychopaths in this room, or more if psychopaths enjoy going to talks about psychopaths, <laughs> uh, which is likely because of um, grandiose sense of self-worth. So there could be, I don't know, 50 psychopaths in this room. It could be carnage by the end of the hour. 4% uh, of business leaders are psychopaths. You're four times more likely to have a psychopath uh, leading you as you are to have one as your subordinate. Uh, and 25% of the prison population is a psychopath. Uh, anyway, um, Robert Hare said to me, forget about some guy in Broadmoor, you know, some hoodlum. The big story is corporate psychopathy. He said, you know, this is huge, that psychopathy is such a, uh, a powerful brain anomaly, it's actually remoulded society all wrong. Um, he said, you should go and find yourself some corporate psychopaths. Uh, so that's what I did. I, I, finally, before I sit down, I'll just tell you a little bit about that. It was a man called Al Dunlap uh, who worked over here for a long time with uh, Kerry Packer. Do people remember him? Yeah, ruthless asset stripper. Um, he, uh, he, 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 would, he would come in, into a failing company and close down factories, fire 30% of the workforce, always with a quip. He had like a sort of funny jokes as he fired people. Like somebody said to him, um, I've just bought myself a car. And he said, you may have a new car, but I'll tell you what, you don't have a job. Um, and the more... Ruthlessly, he behaved. The more the share price shot up, uh, because capitalism rewards this kind of behaviour—the behaviour that uh, seems to speak to the psychopath checklist. Uh, and so he ended up, you know, doing the same thing in three or four companies, making a huge amount of money, uh, and retiring uh, to a giant mansion in Florida, which is where I emailed him, not mentioning psychopath in, in the email. I said he might have a special brain anomaly that made him special. Uh, so he invited me over. He said, come on over. Uh, and he gave me a tour of his house, which was filled with sculptures of predatory animals. It's like, it's like kind of Narnia. Um, <laughs> lions and tigers and... Uh, anyway, I said to him, you know how I said in, your, in my email that you may have a very special brain condition that makes you special? And he said, yeah, it's an amazing theory. Uh, I said, well... <laughs> I said, this may mean that you're... Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, what? I said, I finally heard what I was saying. Uh, I said, I've got a checklist. Can I go through the checklist? And he said, yeah, OK. He was kind of intrigued. So I said, OK, um, grandiose sense of self-worth, which would have been hard for him to deny because he was standing underneath a giant oil painting of himself. <laughs> um, he said, well, you've got to believe in you. I said, uh, cunning manipulative. He said, well, that's leadership. Uh, I said, shallow affect and inability to experience a range of emotions. He said, who wants to be weighed down with some nonsense emotion? You've got to keep moving forward. So he kind of turned the hair psychopath checklist into who moved my cheese. Um, <laughs> not every item. There were some items that didn't apply to him. But it was remarkable that the more ruthlessly one behaves in this screwed up capitalist world of ours, uh, the more one is rewarded. Anyway, I think I, that's all I'll say at this stage, and I'll walk over and maybe we can uh, talk some more. John Ronson. Thank you. Wow. Um, <laughs> just talk about Q&A, John. <laughs> well... <laughs> It was amazing to watch, by the way. Do you think it was? Who I saw it? Did everyone see it? Oh, God. Oh. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I do find it odd. I mean, I, I, find, I find certainty, ideological certainty, to be a weird, you know, to be a very overrated concept. I, and I, saw, I was looking at us all, um, actually, when we were sitting there. I thought, we're like four or five horses. We're just like horses. And the more you know, certain the person is, then the further they, you know, gallop along. Like four, we were four horses, and at the end, one slightly lame horse. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. One horse with a slight inferiority complex, I felt, to uh, Greg. What was his name, Greg? Um, uh, Greg Sheridan. Greg yeah. Sheridan, if I yeah. with that horse, they would have got the screen. Yeah, he was uh, the lame been, horse yeah. at the end. 
I mean, I was a bit of a lame horse myself because of my um, uncertainty, my doubt and uncertainty, but uh, he, was la- he was a lame horse because he just talked bollocks. Uh, <laughs> and then you had, um, he said, um, what did he say? He said, democracies never lie. Dictatorships always lie and democracies never lie. He said at one point. But he said it with certainty, John, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, but that was, you know, when, you know, even... Even certainty is superseded by, you know, <laughs> jaw-dropping bollocks. Um, and then you had kind of Slovo uh, Zizek, um, who I'm sure is brilliant, but I'm basing that quite a lot on just the way he appears to be as opposed to what he actually says, which is His quite incomprehensible. His dress sense has obviously rubbed off on you, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I thought I'd make an effort last night and put on a suit, but, you know, then Zizek turned up in a T-shirt, and I yeah. thought, I'm, you know, I'm bothered. Uh, <laughs> Would yeah. you do it again? I've never done that kind of thing before. Never. I've always turned it down. I, 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 you know, I really do believe that, that you know, any system that values quick extremist thought is not a system that I'll do very well in, frankly. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I, uh, I think once is enough. <laughs> um, uh, now, the men who stare at goats, you interviewed special force soldiers. In them, conspiracy theorists. How did you go with psychopaths in general? You mean how did I get on with them? Yeah. Um, I mean, I found them quite intimidating, um, but very charming. Uh, I mean, it seemed like the natural progression. I suppose madness has always been like the elephant in the room with me. I remember actually about 10 years ago when I was, um, did this thing about David Icke. Do people know David Icke? It's in my book, Them. Uh, he believes that the ruling elite um, are child sacrificing, blood drinking, paedophile lizards who've adopted human form, uh, to which the anti racist groups like the ADL all say, ah, when David Icke says paedophile, blood drinking lizards, he's using code. And what he actually means is Jews. Uh, to which David Icke goes, no, I, I really mean lizards. Um, <laughs> to which the ADL says, that's code too. Um, anyway, I was following, I went to Vancouver and followed both sides, the Ike camp and the anti ike camp, and it ended up with the anti ikes throwing a pie at Ike at a book signing, thinking it would hit him in the face. And his, he would become so pompous that his hypocrisy would, would, you know, he'd out himself in front of all his fans. But unfortunately, the custard pie missed and hit the children's book section. Uh, and like David Ike just watched it go and said... Um, well, that massively backfired, <laughs> and it did. Um, so uh, that was a good story about, you know, I felt a good story about how as the extremists get crazier, so do our responses towards them. Um, but I remember afterwards, people said to me, well, he's just, he's mad, isn't he? And I thought, well, I said, you know, no, you know, because to me, that would like end the fun, that would kind of stop it from being a funny story, if he's just mad, that kind of ends, end, ends the whole thing. Um, but now, I think, or, or suddenly started to think that maybe madness, you know, is a more powerful engine in our society than rationality. Irrationality is the rock, it's the rock thrown in the still pond, it's, a, it's an important thing to write about. Uh, so that's why I wrote The Psychopath Test, I thought I had to confront it head on. Talking about the checklist, uh, is it true that the checklist wouldn't even be around if electric shock treatment wasn't banned? Yeah, there were, that's true. I mean, in the 60s, there were lots of different uh, experimental ways of, of b- both treating and also rooting out psychopaths. So you had this lovely guy called Elliot Barker, uh, who worked in, um, in a mental hospital in Ontario. And his idea was naked hot tub encounter sessions for psychopaths, because uh, he'd been to a bunch of them in Northern California. Uh, where people like Mia Farrow would, you know, kind of do this thing called crotch eyeballing. By the way, I've completely made up the fact that Mia Farrow was there. I think she was never there. Um, <laughs> but they'd all sit in a circle for like 48 hours, uh, and one of them would have to sit in the middle, and they'd all stare at that person's crotch uh, for ages. In fact, if I can find it in time. Well, that's actually, you know, now that you mention it, that's how the early episodes of Q&A were actually... <laughs> So it's, you're not, yeah, that's how that went. Here we go. I found it. It was the first page I turned to. Um, 
I, I found a transcript of one of the crotch eye bowling sessions in Northern California. This is like kind of, you know, uh, well healed, you know, middle class sort of, you know, hippies in the 60s. Um, Paul Bindram, the, um, the head of the group, would say uh, first she had to, um, um, the woman, she was called Lorna, had to give her vagina a name. Uh, so she called her vagina Katie. Uh, and then Bindram said, Tell Katie what things happen in your crotch. Say, Katie, this is where I shit, fuck, piss, and masturbate. There was a silence. I think Katie already knows that. <laughs> 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 um, so, um, anyway, Elliot Barker saw all of this stuff and thought it was beautiful and brought it back to his ward of psychopaths and basically got them crotch eyeballing, uh, got them taking these huge amounts of LSD uh, and for weeks and weeks on end. And finally, after you know, months and months of this, uh, they were all declared cured they were, because their empathy had come to the surface. They'd, they'd regained their lost empathy and they were released and it was kind of wonderful. And then a few years later, they did a study of the people who'd been through these sessions with Elliot Barker. What was the recidivism rate? And in normal circumstances, 60% of high-scoring psychopaths go on to re-offend. Uh, but the ones who'd been through the naked LSD encounter sessions, 80% went on to re-offend. It actually made them worse. Uh, one of them was asked why, and he said, well, it taught us how to fake empathy better. Uh, so... Um, so that was one. And then uh, Robert Hare on the other side had um, set up these electricity generators and he'd, because he'd, uh, he wanted to root them out. He didn't think they could be cured. He wanted to root them out. Uh, so he'd get like psychopathic and non-psychopathic volunteers and he'd strap them up to generators and he'd say, I'm going to count backwards from 10 and when I get to one, you're going to get a very painful electric shock. Um, and he said, I'm sorry. And he went, 10. And, uh, when it got, and the non-psychopaths would be you know, sweating and their heart rate would be going up. And the psychopathic ones, nothing. They hardly broke a sweat. Uh, and then they got the electric shock. And Hare said they gave a, a response. And I said, what, like a shriek? And he said, yeah, like a shriek. Um, and, um, <laughs> um, and then he repeated the test. And he said that the same thing happened. The psychopaths had no um, uh, memory for the pain. S so still, even though they knew how painful the electric shock would be, uh, they didn't sweat and their heart rate didn't go up. Um, just, you know, nothing. Um, and then he tried all these other tests, like uh, he'd scream really loudly in their ears and they wouldn't jump. Um, anyway, that got outlawed, uh, as did the electric <laughs> shocks. And so that's why he came up with the checklist. And now the checklist, you, are, you know very well. You talk about it, it almost becoming like a weapon. Yeah. I mean, when I became a psychopath spotter... Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's on your business card now? Yeah. Humorist and psychopath spotter. <laughs> well, it was Q&A, called me last night, psychopath expert. That felt good. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I use my powers for bad. Um, well, actually, I started off using them for good. Um, I decided to, to use my powers to out people who crossed me in the past <laughs> as psychopaths. Um, so there's a critic, a British TV critic called A.A. A. Gill, who's always very rude about my documentaries. So I outed him as a psychopath. Um, that's classic psychopath. Uh, <laughs> been rude about my documentaries. Uh, uh, there are various other factors about Egil, which are very psychopathic, by the way, um, but I won't go into that now. Um, and then I, I, I um, started spotting, you know, I, I went to see a Haitian death squad leader called Toto Constant, who I think probably is classic psychopath. But, but yeah, it turned me very power mad. Um, so it's a curse? In a way, yeah, like, like a dark superpower like I believe Spider-Man might have. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think of this book as a kind of a cautionary tale. Don't, don't do what I did. Don't get too drunk with your psychopath spotting powers. Although I must say, judging by the emails I've got from readers, most, most people are using it, completely understandably, uh, to diagnose their you know, enemies as psychopaths. Um, I mean, what I wanted to happen was that people would do that and then come out the other side in the way that I did and... Some have and some haven't. Um, Al um, Dunlap, Chainsaw. Yeah. Have you got, how was it spending time? I know you mentioned him, but, you know, yeah. it's a cool nickname. 
Yeah, in- incredibly stressful. Yeah. It was unbelievably stressful. I took a Valium before going to see him, actually. That's how nervous I was about it. Uh, and I was still, my heart was pounding. Uh, my amygdala is the opposite of a psychopath's amygdala. It's constantly shooting signals of fear and remorse and distress up and down to my <laughs> central nervous system. And that was happening, like, loads when I was at Al Dunlap's house. So he I mean, is imagine... a psychopath, though, isn't he? He is one. So how, how, how well, much time actually, did this... you spend with him? Uh, I, sp- well, I spent all day with him. Um, okay. There was basically... Um, some items on the checklist that he didn't, you know, that said didn't apply to him. Like, for instance, early behaviour problems, juvenile delinquency. He said he got into West Point, so he can't have been a juvenile delinquent. Uh, many short-term marital relationships. He's only been married twice. Admittedly, his first wife cited in her divorce papers that he threatened her with a knife and told her he always wondered what human flesh tasted like. But his second <laughs> marriage has been... a has been a good one of 41 years. Um, So he's not, by any means, a classic psychopath. But however, the the, the traits of his that you find on the psychopath checklist are the traits that were massively rewarded by Wall Street. Um, What did you find about in terms of the influence of madness on on, uh, non-psychopaths? uh, on, yeah, on society and their, and their influence, yeah. if you talk about the, some of those percentages before. Yeah, well, I mean, I certainly found, uh, well, you know, I, I found many industries where madness is, is you know, is a, is a tool for entertainment. Uh, I met a woman who worked for, um, as a guest booker on shows, on the kind of Jay Springer type shows, uh, and she said she had a secret trick that she used when trying to work out who to book, and she said she'd ask them what medication they were on. And if they were on like something like lithium, which would indicate, you know, a, a severe problem, she said she wouldn't have them on because, you know, you don't want them to come on the show and then go off and kill themselves. Uh, however, if they were on something like Prozac, she'd think, well, that's good because it means they're angry and they might snap and that would be entertaining. A bit like, you know, in its way, Q&A, right? I mean, a bit like, a, <laughs> yeah. you know, the sort of fetishization of... of, of um, uh, polemicism, I, you know, I, I find to be actually in in a similar ballpark. It's all about it's all about extreme people out there for our entertainment. Um, yeah, and so she said she'd rather uh, she'd rather somebody was on Prozac than on no medication at all because if they were on no medication at all, it would probably mean that they were too boring to be fun. Um, well, then they could be on Q and A then. Um, <laughs> The correlation between madness and media interest, you talk about, you know, we're happy to watch madness uh, on telly and in film, as long as it's not too mad. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, people, you know, get it wrong. I mean, the Simon Cowell shows sometimes cross over the mark and everybody gets a little bit, you know, shuffly and embarrassed, you know, when somebody a bit too mad is on. But yeah, no, my theory is that we're all worried. I mean, I know I am, that we're, you know, a bit unhinged. Uh, and so, you know, at nine o'clock, we sit down to watch somebody who's madder than we are, and it makes us feel a little comforted that we may be nuts, but we're not as nuts as them. You know, isn't that, so it's isn't be su- that the it's purpose be of uh, reality television? Yeah, well, I haven't seen enough uh, uh-huh. reality television. I don't know how. It's on everywhere. But um, what's the, you've just been in Sydney. What's the show that you're obsessed with about bogans oh well, i just saw this thing i don't know if this is like a, a just a sydney phenomenon or uh we were just about uh, things bogans like it was a slideshow it's a, it, it was kind of weird tele- it, was, it was on at the sydney opera house okay. uh and we'd all done this festival called the festival of dangerous ideas which was basically about you know human rights and people being kind to each other you know s- stopping injustice wherever it lies and then it ends with basically a sort of from what I could tell, I mean, I, I hope I didn't kind of misread the situation, a sneering attack on the poor. Uh, <laughs> it was like, you know, it was a guy saying the bogon, and everyone in the crowd at the Sydney Opera House was like, you know, it's like kind of, you know, I'm sort of cheering. It's like, you know, it's like, okay, we care about the workers in Indonesia, but fuck the bogans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I said... Um, you know, I, I, I'm conscious of coming to your culture and possibly misunderstanding the nuances of bogans. But from what I, I said to somebody, so, you, you know, so basically this is an attack on, on the poor. 
Uh, and someone said, someone shouted, because, you know, unfortunately, I pompously did this on stage at the Opera Theatre. And someone shouted out, no, bogans aren't poor. And I said, well, where does that money come from? And I said, well, they do things like mining and truck driving. So it's an attack on miners and truck drivers, then, is it? <laughs> anyway, that was a bit... I couldn't quite work that out. Yeah. I don't anyway, know. the consensus was that it's fine to attack bogans. <laughs> That's how it plays in Sydney, anyway. Uh, have your questions <laughs> uh, ready for John? We're, I'll, I'll just throw a few more at you. Just in terms of... Um, as a as a reassurance for everyone out there, John, if you're worried about being a psychopath, is that what's the answer? It means that you're not one. I, I, I was actually I was surprised by the amount of people who have written to me saying that they they're worried they may be a psychopath after reading my book. I mean, just today I had one. Uh, I have them all the time. But the answer is, if you're worried about being a psychopath, you're not one, because psychopaths don't worry about being psychopaths. Because being a psychopath, if you're a psychopath. It's great. You haven't got any of the painful feelings that, you know, I have. You haven't got the anxiety. You haven't got the, rem the constant guilt and remorse. You haven't got any of those things. I mean, right. it must feel fantastic. You know, I would go as far as to say that, that, you know, being a psychopath must be the most pleasant of all the mental disorders. <laughs> Uh, looking... Unless you're a frotteurist in the midst of a, of a frotteur episode, What's that a probably feels good. Again? Well, this is um, this is a, an argument <laughs> about um, whether the DSM goes too far in labelling um, aberrant behaviour as a mental disorder. A frotteurist is somebody in late adolescence uh, who gets on a train and rubs themselves up against a woman, and the question is: Is that a mental disorder, or is that just being, you know, a creep? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Or, or yeah. friendly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's late teens, though. If you, you know. Uh, yeah, it's late in, teens. Yeah. Exactly. It says the frotteurism <laughs> tends to. Uh, this is what the DSM says. Frotteurism tends to die out when the frotteurist enters adulthood. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, asked and answered. Um, yeah. Uh, can I ask you about just sleuthing in general, John? In terms of uh, when you first started. Uh, doing it, you know, was it how has it changed in terms of because you mentioned early on in the book Google, uh, mm. Wikipedia, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, even LinkedIn, which I, I've never heard of. I don't, I don't quite understand LinkedIn. Yeah, I don't want to be in anyone's LinkedIn no. network. I just <laughs> I don't. don't. I don't no. know why people keep asking me. I don't get it. Um, um, but the, the idea of sleuthing, you know, the, the, hmm. the giant magnifying glass and all that, that seems to that not be part of what you did. You miss the yeah, old days? But it does. No, 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 absolutely not. You know, it's still, you know, everything in the world is on the Internet. But, you know, a lot of it's not very easy to find. I mean, I remember when I, in fact, I remember when I was did writing the Minister at Goats. I mean, all that stuff about Goat Lab, all this kind of secret black off stuff you know they had a, a lab called goat lab which was where they um killed goats just by staring at them uh, it used to be called dog lab uh, but somebody determined it was harder to form an emotional bond with a goat because uh, they tend to bite yep. children at petting zoos uh, and uh, which i've <laughs> noticed in my uh, time uh uh, anyway, that, I, I mean, that was like an amazing discovery of ours. But actually, it was there. It was there on uh, on a Usenet group. But, you know, would have never have found it. So, no, I don't think sleuthing's changed at all because, you know, it may all be on the internet, but it's still it's still a, a, a needle in a haystack. Have you ever written in other styles other than sleuthing, John? Uh, no, I've written a film uh, called Frank about... I, I was in a band called Frank Sidebottom, Oh Blimey Big Band... Uh, what type uh, of music? Uh, it was like um, umpa versions of pop classics. Uh, so it was like, oh, I should be so lucky, 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 lucky. That was one. Uh, and he, always, he wore a big papier mache head that he never took off. Um, and I've written a film about it, um, which hasn't yet been made. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I co-wrote it with Peter Strawn, who wrote Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Uh, so uh, maybe the success of that might spur it on. Now, before we throw it over to the audience, if, do you have any questions for them? God? Um, I mean, we had... I'll just throw you on this uh, No, I think we... Just, All right, then. Uh, we, we've already discussed 
Bogans and Q&A. I should have stuck to the prearranged questions, John. I'm sorry. Um, just, as just before we give it to you, if you're worried about being a psychopath, you aren't one. That's very important to remember. Does anyone have a question uh, for John? Up the... everywhere. Uh, there, that one there will be great. Uh, given your books are about generally strange and irrational people, do you tend to attract that kind of fan base? And um, if so, how do you manage it? I mean, I'd... I'd, I'd... Well, I mean, you know, the answer is, you know, yes and no. I mean, some some of the people who who read my books are the kind of people who are in my books, and then some of the people who read my books are people, you know, like me, you know. So so it's a kind of mix of the two, um, which always kind of works out fine. Actually, I, I like the idea of kind of rationalists and believers all kind of getting together and not beating the crap out of each other. Um, I get lots of emails from people who believe that they're being um, spied on by the CIA and can I investigate? Um, I mean, if everybody who thinks they're being spied on by the CIA actually are being spied on, then the CIA have got a bloody big budget, I'll tell you that. Um, and then I get, you know, people like me. So it's a mix, it's a mix of the two. Down the front? Yeah. Actually, um, mine's not exactly a question. It's an answer, since you did ask about the bogans. Mm. There's no need to worry that you will ever offend a bogan because nobody thinks that they themselves are a bogan. Okay. Everyone so, thinks that someone else is a bogan. Okay. So there's no problem about that. So bogans are like psychopaths. <laughs> right. In Britain, in Britain, there's this term called chav, and I guess it's kind of the same thing. Still don't, I still don't understand how it's okay, though, for, you know, the, we, we, the moneyed of the Sydney Opera House to all have a, you know, yeah. to have a big attack on bogans and... Uh, okay. Uh, I feel out of my depth in this whole bogan thing. I, I, well, there's uh, your next book, though, John, so that's fine. Uh, mm-hmm. Yep, if you got a question. Uh, sorry, wherever the mics are, that's fine. And the front, here we go. Hiya. Hello. Um, I've always been intrigued by that story, The Emperor Has No Clothes On, and I've always wondered why it was one little boy that actually says, no, he hasn't got any clothes on. And I've always wondered what happened to that little boy, and I don't know whether, you know, that was in the story, but hearing all these discussions about psychopaths being in in positions of um, important positions, making responsible decisions, I wonder why the majority of us don't say, hey, you're a psychopath, we don't want you there, the behaviour's unacceptable, piss off and let's put some normal, empathic, kind, caring human beings. Why do we as a society allow that to happen? Because, because we're raised to believe that, you know, deep down everybody's the same, that everybody has conscience, that we're all the same. And that when we go up an escalator, you know, on the train, the people going down the escalator opposite, you know, if you could get inside their heads, you'd see that we're all basically the same. And, you know, the fact is, is that we're not all the same. Uh, 99% of us are, but there are, you know, there is this condition that means that people have no empathy and they're manipulative and they, they're like the lions chasing the kudu. Um, and, um, yeah, and it's really, really hard for, for us liberals to, to, to think of people that way. And that's part of the reason why they get away with it. Sorry. What, why what, can't they be screened out? If there's all these tests for psychopathic behaviours, why don't we say, you know, mm. we're going to screen you out of, of decisions where you impact on a lot of people? So we start screening the politicians, so we start screening the executives and the CEOs. And I'm really serious about yeah, this. Well, this actually, isn't funny. Yeah, no, well, actually, uh, people who work for Robert Hare are sometimes brought in to, like, big corporations and asked to screen... Uh, the candidates for top jobs for psychopathy. Uh, but they said to me, one of them said to me that whenever he's asked to do that, he always worries that if he spots a high-scoring psychopath, instead of rooting them out, they'll give him the job. Help <laughs> promote them. That's, uh, yeah. that's a real concern. Uh, yeah. Questions for John? Yes. And there's some at the back too. We'll get to you. Um, could we use some of your uh, psychopath spotting to check out Tony Abbott, please? <laughs> Someone said that to me last night about Tony Abbott, um, but 
I, I mean, in all seriousness, I'm not gonna, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not good to diagnose people from afar with psychopathy because it's a real, it is a real thing. I mean, which is why in my book, I only ever you know, wrote about people who would agree to meet me and I was completely fair. I told them what I was doing and, you know, my um, power-crazed flaws are on show as well. You know, it's not just, you know, the omnipotent me meeting the potential business psychopath. It's more kind of complex than that in the book. Uh, So, you know, I can't start swooshing in and labelling Tony Abbott is a psychopath. That doesn't Um, feel like the sort of thing I should do. (laughs) Uh, You know when you're armed with that checklist, because you've Uh, you've said it's a weapon, when you're interviewing people for the book, did you ever find yourself getting... um, you know, disappointed and underwhelmed by the answers you were getting because you really wanted them to be a psychopath and they weren't? Yeah, totally. That happened with Al Dunlap. Uh, like, whenever he said to me, you know, no, this particular psychopathic trait doesn't apply to me, I thought to myself, oh, well, I won't put that in the book. And, then, uh, <laughs> and it was only later I thought, God, you know, I've gone a bit psychopathic with my, with my checklist skills. Uh, absolutely. And, um, and that happens in journalism all the time. You know, my friend Adam Curtis said to me, we're like medieval monks. You know, we travel around the world as journalists with our notepads in our hand and we, you know, stitch together a kind of tapestry of the madness and we leave out the boring normal stuff and just get a little bit of madness in, a little bit of madness in, stitch it together. That's what we spend our lives doing and we all know it and none of us really like to talk about it. Uh, there's your for, there's your nickname, by the way. For you, you'll know you will now be known as the monk, uh, John <laughs> Ronson. Um, question up the back, right up the back. What sorts of disorder do you think Slavoj Žižek might have? <laughs> oh well, I think I think Slavoj has a. I mean, like me, I think he has an anxiety disorder, um, but that shows he's he's a good person. And anxiety disorders are indicative of of moral goodness. <laughs> you know, I say that as a self-aggrandizing joke, but I also mean it. Um, you know, OC- the sufferers of OCD, for instance, are, are good people. Tourette's sufferers are, are good people. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a disorder that actually really does, I think, come from moral goodness. I actually mean that. Uh, because, um, you know, it's all about fear that you're going to insult people or you know a fear that there's sort of a darkness inside of you and you don't want a darkness inside of you and that's why you know people develop things like OCD so actually anxiety disorders really do indicate uh, a moral goodness uh man up the back in the pinstripe suit (laughs) <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, thanks very much, John. Um, you mentioned that you make, you, you know, your work is finding patches of insanity and stitching them together. Mm. I was wondering if you had a, uh, a patch, um, perhaps excluding Australians' fetishes for bogans, um, yeah, if you had a patch of insanity in your sights for your next book. Yeah, uh, I mean, and, you know, when I say that we go around stitching together, you know, tapestry of people's madnesses obviously when you become aware that that's what you do hopefully you know you don't do it quite so much anymore or at least you do it with an awareness and you try and do it in an ethical way um yeah i have got a new area i want to write about actually i um like in my last book in the psychopath book I, i'm interested in you know telling stories about powerful people sort of the you know enfranchised people which is why the whole bogans thing actually kind of st- felt a bit bad to me because satire is about is about attacking the powerful isn't it not not attacking the disenfranchised but i don't know enough about bogans um but um but i don't really, i'm not sure that i want to really say what it is because what if i told you the idea i have for my next book i would then instantly scrutinize all of your faces and if <laughs> any one of you looked sort of disappointed in any way it would just crush me um <laughs> So I think I will. And the other thing is, the way I write my books is is really organic. Uh, so at the moment, it's about something, but it could easily twist into something else. Um, but the main reason I don't want to say is because I don't want to. I don't want to just you know 
anxiously gauge the atmosphere, looking for <laughs> any look that might say, that sounds a bit shit. <laughs> I felt exactly the same way when I was writing the Psychopath book, by the way. Well, yeah. that turned out all right. That turned out okay. Uh, yes, on the side. Uh, John, have you ever run your checklist over the psychiatrists and the psych- Scientologists? I, I mean, I was careful not to <laughs> run out of the, I was kind of dicing with death with the Scientologists a little bit in the book, because if you're too mean to them, they conspire to destroy you. <laughs> and if you're too nice to them then you're a Scientology apologist. So it's a bit stupid, me, because I was spending time with them anyway. Uh, but also, I've got to tell you that the Scientologists, weirdly, were, were pretty nice to me in the book. You know, they got me into... Um, in, when I was writing the book, they got me into Broadmoor and didn't ask for anything in return and let me look through their archive and so on. So, you know, in the end, I, 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 I didn't want to launch some kind of gratuitous attack on them uh, because they were perfectly nice to me. Um... Uh, so the psychiatrists, I mean, of course, you know, I mean, it's, it's as everyone knows, an, an awful lot of people who, who, you know, work as psychiatrists go in uh, to self-diagnose, uh, which sort of stands to reason. Um, and, you know, the worst excesses of psychiatry, like the worst excesses of the pharmaceutical industry, um, are psychopathic in nature. There's, there's no doubt about that. I mean, you know, uh, uh, and a classic example of that is childhood bipolar disorder, that it's a completely fabricated illness doesn't exist. I mean, bipolar disorder manifests in late adolescence, yet four-year-old kids in America are being labelled bipolar and stuck on antipsychotic medication because they've got temper tantrums. And, you know, that is undoubtedly a fake disease that's propagated by the pharmaceuticals and the worst excesses of psychiatry. There's no doubt about that. Time for a couple more. Where's the mic? What happens to the kids? Well, one little girl died, a girl called Rebecca Riley. Uh, she died uh, because, uh, you know, she had an overdose of her antipsychotics. Um, oh, later on. Oh, well, I said to, some, I said to um, a mother of, of a kid um, who'd been diagnosed with bipolar, yeah, what happens when they get older? And she said, oh, well, some, uh, some grow out of it, some don't. And I said, yeah, but I thought bipolar disorder is supposed to be a lifelong condition. You don't grow out of it. And she said, well, my husband grew out of his asthma. Uh, so, um, yeah, I did get one email from somebody. I mean, I, I, you know, I wrote what I said about childhood bipolar disorder in the book. And I did get an email from one person who said that she's bipolar and she's felt all her life that something was wrong. Um, and I wish... You know, I wish I'd talked to her while I was writing the book, but that's just one email from one person, but obviously a, a compelling one. The side there? And the front there? Yeah. Anyone? Okay, I'll go. Um, I'm just curious what we do once we have identified people as psychopaths, because the impression I get is that it's not curable. So what do we do if we want what, to... What do we do? Well, exactly, and this is a huge issue all over the world, and, and it's more now than ever, because court experts, you know, who, who themselves are... Uh, quite often a tyrannical and pseudo-scientific industry, uh, do what I did, went on a three-day course uh, to become psychopath spotters, and are called on routinely in sentencing hearings and parole hearings uh, to determine from afar how psychopathic the person in the dock is. And if they score high, like my friend Tony, uh, they end up getting locked away for many more years than they would have done um, you know, if they'd just been sentenced for that particular crime. And that's clearly... And because of the, you know, the recidivism rates. But, you know, that's clearly wrong. Uh, I spent ages trying to work out about Tony. Is he a psychopath or is he a miscarriage of justice? And, and, and of course, the answer is he's both. Um, so what do you do? I, I think what you do is you, you, you be wary. You know, you, you arm yourself with the knowledge because it is a real thing. And you be wary and don't let them get inside your head. I mean, there's certain occasions in my past of people I've, you know, interviewed and made documentaries with who I can now see were psychopaths and they made my life, you know, living hell. And I kind of wish I knew then what I know now because I think it would have just allowed me to put an arm around myself and not been as manipulated by them as I was. 
If you are in a dock and there is a um, psychopathic expert called to cross-examine, you are in a lot of trouble anyway, aren't you, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, <laughs> Tony always denied being a psychopath. He said um, one of the items on the checklist is lack of remorse, but, of course, another item is pathological lying and cunning manipulative. <laughs> so if you say, no, I do feel very remorseful, they say typical of the psychopath. It's a bit like the ADL with David Icke, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Typical of the psychopath to claim remorse when they have none. And of course, the, the, the more that they look, you look like you're improving once you're in the psychiatric hospital, the uh, more proof uh, there is that the hospital is working. Yeah, well, so, again, it's t- absolutely. I mean, Tony was in this kind of weird thing that you could on- he, they could only detain him if he was being treated. So, uh, and in Broadmoor, treatment includes just making small talk over lunch. So he had to like not talk to anybody. He had to stay completely silent because that was the only way he could legally be released from Broadmoor. Um, yeah. And, and of course, in the end, like which you was, said... Which was then obviously seen as a sign of madness because yeah. he was like aloof and grandiose. And he was eventually diagnosed as a psychopath, as you meant. So, yeah, and, uh, and is now out. He did 14 years and, and got released about a year ago. All's well that ends well. Uh, <laughs> one more, maybe, <laughs> down uh, the side yeah. there. Ah, yes. Your work, oh, Josh Canal. Thanks, yeah. thanks sir. Uh, your work seems to kind of tread that line of in- investigating people who are just on the other side of the normal line in- into deluded. Uh, and in doing all of this investigation and surrounding yourself by, by these people, do you ever find yourself thinking, oh, actually, they've got the answer. They're right. Oh, God, yeah, every time. Uh, just, <laughs> <laughs> practically. I mean, you only have to spend a couple of weeks with David Icke. I mean, he's very... Plausible, you know, to think, well, of course, the reason why the Queen hasn't sued him is because she's a lizard. Uh, <laughs> I do think, I even thought it a little bit with the many stare at goats. Some of the remote viewers were telling me that London Zoo was about to be destroyed by a dirty bomb uh, because uh, in their psychic visions, this is like military, you know, or certainly taken seriously by the military post 9 11. She said in her um, psychic vision, she knew it was London Zoo because she could really feel the elephants screaming in agony and then I got back to England, this was in California, I got back to England and a couple of days later my son said can we go to London Zoo and I was like walking through London Zoo thinking only I know (laughs) 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 and uh, you know these poor people don't know like it was like that's like source code. <laughs> That's like Jake Gyllenhaal and source code. Uh, and um, uh, you're, and the only only... One, you're the only one in this country to have seen that movie. By right, the way, too, yeah, John. I, saw, I saw it on the plane coming up. It's very good. I recommend it. Um, <laughs> and, and, the only, and, and the bubble burst when I realised that actually the elephants had all been moved to Whipsnade. Uh, <laughs> so there aren't any elephants at London Zoo. Um, yeah, no, I've got a very fragile sense of you know, certainty, my own personal certainty. I do tend to agree with um, whatever anybody's saying to me eventually. But I think, you know what, I think that's good. I, th- I think, because I think it means that you write better. You, you, um, uh, you um, put yourself in their position. You see the world through their eyes. And as long as you can kind of regain your rationality when you're back home writing it, it's actually, I think, a good trait to have. Yeah. Um, I feel I should just say I agree with you <laughs> and uh, say that that's all we've got time for. Um, I think the Wheeler Centre is giving you some sort of gift, a giant all painting Ooh. of yourself, uh, John, <laughs> to take home. So uh, look forward to that. Um, congratulations on the book, The Psychopath Test. I can't wait to read it. And uh, <laughs> no, no John, I wish John Safran hadn't pissed off to Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm only here because John Saffron um, is not. Um, so I'll finish with this. Is John Saffron a psychopath? Classic psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason he wouldn't do it is because he wanted a giant oil painting of himself behind us. <laughs> well, he talked to you. But um, no, congratulations. It's a magnificent book. John Ronson, The Psychopath Test. John will be up the back signing some books uh-huh. and drinking some beers. So... Um, who uh, go and uh, buy a book and get him to sign it. Um, thank you very much for coming. John Ronson, ladies thank and gentlemen. You.